Along with the Essene calendar and the ancient understanding of ages, which is an interesting study all on its own, the Book of Enoch provides us with another way of measuring time. Now, this is not as much of a calendar as it is a prophetic formula. However, this formula does encompass the entire 7,000 years of human history from among the Dead Sea Scrolls. While we may not have fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls that clearly lay out the idea of 2,000 year ages, such as what the Essenes believed, we do have something from the Book of Enoch, which was also found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, showing a totality of 7,000 years. Now, instead of being split up into seven 1,000 year periods, or four ages in three and a half 2,000 year periods, the Book of Enoch divides human history into 700-year periods called weeks, with each day equaling 100 years. This prophecy is called Enoch's Ten Weeks, or Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks. This prophecy comes from the Book of Enoch, chapters 91 and 93. We do have some fragments from the prophecy of the Dead Sea Scrolls to compare what we have from the Ethiopic version. If we're understanding this correctly, the years of the 10 weeks should be as follows. As you can see, the BC and AD dates are provided, but also the AM dates, which stands for Anno Mundi, or Year of the World, which measures years from creation forward. So for example, the year 700 AM would be 700 years after creation. And this is how the Dead Sea Scrolls record time. What's amazing about this specific prophecy is its astounding accuracy. Now, while we don't have the complete prophecy in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we do have enough of it to compare it to the Ethiopic version of Enoch that we've had for quite some time. Now, amazingly, they match considerably well. If the parts that we have match, then it stands to reason that the rest would have matched as well. I mean, after all, for the translators of the Ethiopic version to invent the prophecy, they would have had to know exactly what parts would be discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls and what parts would be lost to time and degradation. And I don't see any way that that would be possible. Study of this 10-week prophecy can become very extensive and actually could fill the pages of a book all its own, but we can look at some of the basics to show its accuracy. The Dead Sea Scrolls provide us with week one, the first half of week two, the second half of week 7, and weeks 8 through 10 in full. We can fill in the rest of the weeks with the Ethiopic version. Explaining the first week and part of the second from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Enoch states, When he was delivering his letter, Enoch resumed his speech and said, I, Enoch, was born on the seventh day in the first week, and until my time, justice was still strong. After me will come the second week, when deceit and violence will increase. 4Q Enoch 318, 24 through 25. Some translations, such as the Ethiopian Gies to English, render this passage as if Enoch were saying that he was born in the seventh in a genealogical line during the first week. The Dead Sea Scrolls version says that he was born on the seventh day in the first week. Now this is interesting because in actuality both would be correct. If we do the math, we discover Enoch was born in the year 622 AM, which would be on the seventh day in the first week, if each day is 100 years. Also in accordance with the Ethiopic version, Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam. We're given the first few words of the second week from the Dead Sea Scrolls. To understand what is said about the entire second week, we can look to the Ethiopic version, which is where we will obtain all Ethiopic translations of this prophecy. And after me there shall arise in the second week great wickedness, and deceit shall have sprung up, and in it there shall be the first end, and in it a man shall be saved. And after it is ended, unrighteousness shall grow up, and a law shall be made for the sinners. Enoch 93, 4. 
Now this is clearly talking about the events which led up to Noah's flood. Great wickedness was caused by fallen angels mating with human women, and we get that from Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and there was the first end. Now we're not sure what this is because the flood would have happened in 1656 AM, yet this week concludes in 1400 AM. So it's possible that the first end described here doesn't have to do with the world being destroyed by the flood, but instead is referring to the genetic and moral corruption of humanity in the days of Jared, which we also read about in Enoch chapter 6, verse 6. And this would fall within that timeline. Also, the it from after it is ended might be talking about the wickedness, or it could be talking about the second week itself. So in either case, this part of the prophecy could be looking ahead a bit past the second week. Noah would be the man who was saved, though rather than describing the flood, this would be referring to him being saved from the fallen angels and Nephilim giants on the earth in those days. Unrighteousness rises again, so there is a law for sinners, which might be what Noah was preaching about during that time according to 2 Peter 2.5, before the flood was announced. For week three, the book of Enoch states, And after that, in the third week, at its close, a man shall be elected as the plant of righteous judgment, and his posterity shall become the plant of righteousness forevermore. Enoch 93.5 Since this only discusses the close of the third week, it could be that the description of the second week bled over a little bit into the beginning of the third. And if this is happening, then we could consider the second and third weeks together, in which case we could include the flood. Now, near the close of the third week, the only man this could be referring to is Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. This also tells us the term plant of righteousness has to do with the Jewish people, and that's important to know because that will come up again. Describing week four, Enoch says, And after that, in the fourth week, at its close, visions of the holy and righteous shall be seen, and a law for all generations, and an enclosure shall be made for them. Enoch 93, 6. The events that best fit this description within this time are the exodus and the giving of the law to Moses and the children of Israel. Moses saw visions of the holy and righteous upon Mount Sinai. The law for all generations is the Torah, and the enclosure is most likely referring to the tabernacle or the first entrance of the promised land by the children of Israel, since that falls within this time period as well. Next, Enoch says about week five, And after that, in the fifth week, at its close, the house of glory and dominion shall be built forever. Enoch 93, 7. This could be describing Solomon's temple, which would have been around 2935 AM. But since it refers to at its close, it's most likely referring to the second temple, which would have been in 3408 AM. Now, this could also have something to do with Israel itself rather than only the temple. Also, I should note, sometimes in Hebrew, the word forever does not always mean a never-ending span of time like it does in English. Sometimes it can mean a dispensation of time. I do develop that idea further in my book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, from a Dead Sea Scroll called Psalms of Exorcism. But since it applies to this prophecy as well, it should at least be mentioned here. Therefore, we don't necessarily only need to look for some kind of house that still exists, though it could be that, but we can also include something that was built for a dispensation of time, and the temple would definitely fit that description. Concerning week six, Enoch states, And after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded. And the hearts of all of them shall godlessly forsake wisdom, and in it a man shall ascend. And at its close the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. Enoch 93, 8. Now this is where it begins to get really interesting. Remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written at least one or two hundred years before Christ, probably longer in some cases. 
It might be easy to invent everything before the sixth week. However, the Qumran community would have had the Book of Enoch prior to the birth of Christ, the destruction of the temple, and the scattering of the Jewish people amongst the nations. Yet, as we can plainly see, this is what is being described in week six. This is also where we make the switch from BC to AD in our current system of recording years. Next, and probably the most difficult to identify and requires its own section in this video, is week 7. The Ethiopic version states, And after that in the seventh week shall an apostate generation arise, and many shall be its deeds, and all its deeds shall be apostate, and at its close shall be elected the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness to receive sevenfold instruction concerning all his creation. Enoch 93 9 through 10. What we have from the Dead Sea Scroll version states, But all their deeds will be at fault. At its close, the chosen ones will be selected as witnesses of the justice from the plant of everlasting justice. They shall be given wisdom and knowledge sevenfold. They shall uproot the foundations of violence and the work of deceit in it in order to carry out justice. 4Q Enoch 4, 11 through 14. As we can see, we're given a little extra information in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Many have assumed that verse 9 from the Ethiopic version is talking about the Catholic Church and the Dark Ages. And that very well could be. However, Islam was also founded during this time, so we would have to consider that as a possibility as well. To narrow it down, we must identify the other group mentioned, called Chosen Ones, who are selected as witnesses of the justice from the plant of everlasting justice, according to the Dead Sea Scroll version. The Ethiopic version translates this as the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness. Now remember, from week three, the plant of righteousness has to do with Abraham and the Jewish people. So we should be able to find a sect of Jewish people who were called out from many Jews during this time. This should also have something to do with wisdom and knowledge or an instruction concerning his creation. It should be a substantial change from the norm at that time, since it is described as a sevenfold instruction and wisdom and knowledge sevenfold. Now, months before writing my new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, I was puzzling over this prophecy. I really couldn't figure it out. I believed that it might somehow involve Catholicism of that time and perhaps the iconoclast movement having to do with idolatry, since it was occurring at that time. While I was researching this, though, I only had access to the Ethiopic translation and I wasn't aware of the slight differences and additions found in the Dead Sea Scroll version. I even emailed my good friend Dr. Ken Johnson, who is an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls, about what I was thinking at the time, although admittedly I wasn't convinced of it fully myself. And actually, here's an excerpt of that email. You'll have to excuse any obvious typos or grammatical errors. This was a personal email, but this shows kind of what I was thinking at the time. The only thing I can find that remotely fits this is the Second Council of Nicaea, which had seven sessions, each one ending with a determination, so literally seven distinct teachings slash instructions and it all related to the veneration of icons, or what we might go as far as to say the veneration or worship of idols. The second commandment says not to make, worship, or serve any graven images of any in heaven, earth, or in the sea. Basically, all of creation. Now, the Second Council of Nicaea determined the veneration of icons was acceptable. But what if the ones who determined that were part of the apostate generation and the instruction that the righteous were receiving concerning all of creation was a bad instruction from the apostates about icons slash idols. Is it possible the instruction the righteous received does not come from God and is not a good instruction? After I sent that email, I knew I needed more study, but at the time I felt I had exhausted all of my options. The initial interpretation I concluded did not seem right, but I simply did not know where else to look. I've learned throughout the years that the best thing to do in those situations is to put it in prayer and leave it to the Lord and just wait on him to reveal the answer if he so chooses. So that's exactly what I did. Months later, actually up until the day before the time that I was supposed to write this part of 
my new book, I was writing on the 10 weeks prophecy of Enoch, and I stopped after week six. The end of the workday had come, but I knew the following day I would have to once again tackle week seven. And I always felt that the icon, idol, Catholicism interpretation wasn't satisfactory, so I didn't want to offer that as a valid interpretation in the book. If I was going to include it at all, I wanted to use it as I'm using it here, an example of my thought process that led me to the eventual answer. So at that time, I was ready to simply just admit that I had no idea what the interpretation was and just move on to week eight. But that night, I was relaxing in bed. I was getting ready to go to sleep for the night. I had turned on a series that I had been watching during my downtime by Dr. Chuck Missler, a brilliant Bible teacher who went home to be with the Lord in May of 2018. The teaching was on the book of Colossians, and it had absolutely nothing to do with the book of Enoch, the Dead Sea Scrolls, or virtually any other subject that I was addressing in my new book. I was about halfway through the teaching, around the fourth or fifth session, and suddenly, seemingly at random, but too precise to be mere chance, the answer to Enoch's seventh week appeared on the screen. Now, the funny thing is, Dr. Missler wasn't teaching anything about the book of Enoch, and there, were, there was no indication that he even knew his teaching had anything to do with this prophecy. So I quickly paused the television after his explanation. I turned to my wife and I said, that's it, that's Enoch's seventh week. I quickly made note of it in my phone for the following day, then I turned the session back on. Now about an hour later, in the next session, Another interesting bit of seemingly coincidental teaching came up. Dr. Missler started describing a practice that every Christian should be doing considering a familiar Bible verse. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14, 26, KJV. Dr. Missler suggested that any time we come across an unfamiliar verse in the Bible and don't know what it means, we should pray to God for the answer, remind him of his promise in John 14, 26, and then wait. Dr. Missler then suggested keeping a record of the verse in a personal journal for later use. He said it likely won't happen right away, but eventually God will reveal the answer and most likely he'll do it in an unexpected way, such as in an overheard conversation or a thought that occurs while eating dinner. Somehow, he said, God will provide an answer, and when he does, we should find that spot in the journal with our original question, write down how God taught us the answer. And this is because there's going to be times where we as Christians go through doubts and difficult times. When those times occur, we can pick up that journal and read through the many ways that God has tutored us throughout our lives. Now, unbeknownst to Dr. Missler, he just happened to say this right after he inadvertently gave me the answer to a question I had been spending months trying to find. Dr. Missler recorded those sessions over a decade before God used them in my life, as I'm sure he's used them in various ways throughout an untold number of lives since the time of their recording. Because of this, I decided to take Dr. Missler's advice and record that story in my book, hoping that it will not only be an encouragement to me should I ever run into my own season of doubt, but so that it can encourage others as well. You know, we may not always be able to recognize how God is teaching us throughout our lives, but we can be assured that he is. We also may never know how God is working through our lives for the benefit of other people, but we can be certain that if we follow his desires rather than our own, he can use that obedience in amazing and impactful ways. Dr. Missler was discussing the history of the Karahite Jewish movement. As he was explaining how they were formed and what they stood for, I realized that this was an excellent fit to week seven of Enoch's prophecy. While I was writing the book, I found it funny that I had briefly mentioned a possible connection with the Karahite Jews and Sadducees in a previous chapter, which I had written weeks earlier. Had I continued on that trail, I might have come to the answer of Enoch's seventh week back then, but the Lord has his perfect timing for everything. Now, there is some debate as to when Karahite Judaism first sprung up, but most agree that it gained a substantial foothold somewhere between the 7th and 9th centuries, which that would actually fit perfectly within the time frame of Enoch's seventh week. As one online publication words it, quote, Led by a Nazi, Prince, 
Claiming Davidic lineage, the Karaites attracted many scholars of distinction in biblical exegesis, law, Hebrew lexicography, and philosophy." End quote. Originally, Karaite Judaism branched off from the mainstream Talmudic Judaism of the time. They absolutely rejected the notion of the Oral Torah, and instead they preferred to recognize the Written Torah as the supreme authority in religious law and theology, even borrowing some of their traditions and interpretations from the Essenes among other ancient Jewish groups. It's also believed that Karahite Judaism formed as a reaction to Islam. So this leaves us with a couple of options for how to interpret week seven. If Islam is the prophesied apostate generation, and if Karahite Judaism rose as a reaction to it, then the Karahite Jews could be the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness. Now this wouldn't mean that they themselves were righteous in the sense of following Christ, rather, compared to what Jews in general, or the plant of righteousness, were doing by following the mainstream precepts of Judaism, elevating oral Torah and the Talmud above the Torah, the Karahites could be the called out ones, elected to resist Islam, go back to Torah only, and through that receive their sevenfold wisdom and knowledge. This would have been a great amount of wisdom and knowledge compared to that which was found in Talmudic Judaism of the time. Now, on the other hand, there actually might be a simpler explanation. The apostate generation of verse 9 from the Ethiopic version might not be describing Islam or even Catholicism at all. Instead, it might be describing Talmudic Judaism itself. Now remember, Talmudic Judaism sprang up after the destruction of the temple in AD 70. It was formed from surviving Pharisees. When we look through history, ancient Pharisees were certainly violent. One only needs to read through the pages of the four Gospels to discover that fact. So, Pharisees and any group developing from them would have a tradition and history of violence. If Talmudic Judaism, which was formed from ancient Pharisaical Judaism, is the apostate generation, then it would make sense how the Karahite Jews could fulfill the rest of the prophecy. Not only were they given a sevenfold instruction concerning all of creation, which would be gained by putting the Torah, including the creation account in Genesis, above Talmudic interpretations and traditions, but by rejecting the traditions of the Pharisee turned Talmudic Jews, they would also fulfill the last part of the Dead Sea Scroll version, which states, they shall uproot the foundations of violence and the work of deceit in it in order to carry out justice. The foundation of violence and works of deceit would describe the Pharisees. By rejecting Talmudic traditions, the Karahite Jews would have been uprooting that Pharisaical foundation. Other translations render the final part as, quote, to pass judgment on it, end quote, rather than carry out justice. Given that, we can see how the Karahite Jews passed judgment on Talmudic Judaism. As one online source explains, quote, The best part of the Karahite intellectual effort was directed at proving the errors of the rabbinates. Their critical acuteness and thorough knowledge of rabbinical doctrines ensured the high level of their polemics, and their religious attack was accompanied by bitter social criticism of the Jewish leadership, the exilarchs, the geonim, heads of the academies, and the dignitaries which surrounded them. Therefore, in my opinion, Enoch's seventh week is likely not describing Catholicism or Islam, though admittedly that's still a possibility. Rather, I believe that it's far more likely the entire seventh week is regarding the rise of the Karahite Judaism movement, the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness, or called out ones from mainstream Judaism, which God used to pass judgment against Talmudic Judaism, or the apostate generation. Now, he did this by offering Karahite Jews a sevenfold instruction, wisdom, and knowledge through the Torah instead of Talmudic traditions. And in fact, we can even see historically that Karahite Jews, because they were so different and set apart, enjoyed protections that Talmudic Jews did not. Now, it's possible that that was part of a judgment from God against Talmudic Judaism in a similar way that the destruction of the temple was a judgment against the Pharisees and Sadducees. Deciding to go back to the Torah and rejecting Talmudic tradition could have been enough for the Karahite Jews to escape this particular judgment. Now, in my opinion, the theological battle between Talmudic and Karahite Judaism seems to be the most likely fulfillment of Enoch's seventh week.
Now that the mystery of the seventh week has been uncovered, we can move on to the eighth. The Ethiopic version states, And after that there shall be another, the eighth week, that of righteousness, and a sword shall be given to it that a righteous judgment may be executed on the oppressors, and sinners shall be delivered into the hands of the righteous, and at its close they shall acquire houses through their righteousness, and a house shall be built for the great king in glory forevermore. Enoch 91, 12-13 the Dead Sea Scroll version reads, After this, the eighth week will come, the one of justice, in which a sword will be given to all the just, for them to carry out just judgment against the wicked, who will be delivered into their hands. At its close they will gain riches in justice, and there will be built the temple of the kingship of the Great One in his magnificence for all eternal generations. 4Q Enoch 4, 15-18 Now as we can see, these translations are really similar. We have the Crusades during this time in which, at least in part, European Christians were fighting against the oppression of Muslims. Now the success of the First Crusade occurred in AD 1099, right after the beginning of Enoch's eighth week. Now to be clear, the accuracy of this prophecy would not necessarily justify every single action from every human being during the Crusades. Because it's such a contested and debated topic today, attempting to find out exactly what happened can be really challenging. Each modern and even historical source seems to have its own bias. Especially today, sources try to paint the Crusades in either the best or the worst light possible. And it's entirely possible that God had his plans accomplished through this time, but fallible human beings took it much too far and began operating outside of the will of God. However, the prophecy of week 8 mentions the righteous. Can God consider sinful men who make horrible mistakes as righteous? Of course, if they're believers, this is actually one of the main tenets of Christianity. We are considered righteous not by our own acts, but by the blood of Jesus, which washes away all sin. Now, this is not an excuse to sin. Rather, it's a remedy for the fallen state of man. And in fact, as we discover when reading through the Bible, God has a habit of working through imperfect, flawed human beings. Lot, according to Genesis, was extremely carnal. He offered his daughters to a ravenous mob, Genesis 19, 1 through 11, and he even entered an incestuous sexual relationship with his daughters after getting drunk. We read about that in Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Yet, Lot was considered righteous by biblical standards. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, in anguish over the debauched lifestyle of lawless men, for while he lived among them day after day, that righteous man was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. 2 Peter 2, 7 through 8, NET. Well, how can this be? It's because our righteousness isn't measured by our own actions, thank God, but by our faith. In the Old Testament, we see that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. We get that in Genesis 15, verse 6. Today, the only difference between the believer and the unbeliever is the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. Because of that, we are considered righteous despite those sins. The second part of the week 8 prophecy seems to be about the Protestant Reformation. This is interesting because in week 7, the Jewish people had their own type of rebellion against man-made traditions in favor of biblical text by itself. Near the end of week 8, Martin Luther rebelled against the Catholic Church and perpetuated a movement of Christianity that also rejected man-made traditions in favor of biblical text by itself. Now, the temple or house in the prophecy likely refers to the body of Christ since believers are described as temples in the Bible. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 KJV. For we know that if our earthly house, the tent we live in, is dismantled, we have a building from God, a house not built by human hands, that is eternal in the heavens. For in this earthly house we groan because we desire to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed after we have put on our heavenly house, we will not be found naked. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 3, NET. When we put Christ first and truly follow him, 
we together become his temple. Each Christian becomes a house to the Lord. Winning souls to the Lord through faith instead of works can easily fulfill the part of the prophecy that says we, Christians, will acquire houses through their righteousness. And the temple that is built for the Lord is the whole body of believers in Christ who trust in him for salvation rather than their own works. Week 9 begins to explore a future time from our own. The Ethiopic version says, And after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment shall be revealed to the whole world, and all the works of the godless shall vanish from all the earth, and the world shall be written down for destruction, and all mankind shall look to the path of uprightness. Enoch 91.14 The Dead Sea Scrolls version states, and after that, the ninth week, in it will be revealed justice and just judgment to all the sons of the whole earth. And those who act wickedly will vanish from all the whole earth, and they shall be hurled into the eternal well. All men will see the just eternal path. 4Q Enoch 4, 19 through 22a. It's probably obvious that this is referring to the return of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. This week occurs between the years A.D. 1675 and A.D. 2375. Now what's amazing, the exact midpoint of week 9, because half of 700 is 350, so 350 years after 1675, is 2025. Now this, as I write about in my new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, is the beginning of the final jubilee, the final 50 years of our current age the Age of Grace, according to the Essene calendar, before the Kingdom Age is supposed to begin. Now, is that just a coincidence? When I first came across this, I wanted to see if there was any indication that something is unique about this week. I wanted to know if there was any reason beyond just the interest in the year 2025 to read the prophecy this way. I wondered if we should expect the events of this prophecy to occur at the midway point. But then I noticed the detail about how the time frames within the weeks are described. There's actually a commonality among almost all the weeks that week 9 does not share. Most describe something happening at the close of a week. However, week 9 does not suggest whether these events will happen at the beginning or the middle or near the close of the week. So this made me wonder if any other week has a similar lack of description about the timing. The first week gives us an idea of the timing because Enoch says he was born on the seventh day in the first week. This would have correlated between 600 and 700 AM, and in fact, he was born in 622 AM, so this is accurate. The second week, much like the ninth, does not offer any kind of timeline. The only thing we know is a man, presumably Noah, will be saved through what we can assume is the sin of the watchers and eventual genetic and moral corruption of the entire world. Chapter 6 of the Book of Enoch tells us that this event began in the days of Jared. And they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. Enoch chapter 6 verse 6. The days of Jared would have been between the years 460 AM and 1422 AM, since that is when Jared was born and died. We know the second week would be between 700 and 1400 AM, so this fits in really well. Also, for a man to be saved in it, it stands to reason he would need to have been already born. Noah was born in 1056 AM. Now, Note that the halfway point between 700 and 1400 is 1050. The year 1050 AM is exactly the halfway point of week two. So when we're not offered a description of a specific time, such as the close or the seventh day, we have something that seems to point to roughly the middle of the week in which was born Noah, the man who was saved. Weeks 3 through 8 all have something pointing to the end of the week with the phrase at its close. Week 9 does not contain a hint of the timing within the description of the week. And lastly, week 10 describes the seventh part. So the only two weeks that do not offer us a time frame are week 2 and week 9. Week 2 seems to contain a reference that could be pointing to the halfway point. So could it be? 
that if the timing is not offered, it's meant to be understood as describing events that will occur roughly in the middle of the week? If so, could we begin to see the fulfillment of Enoch's ninth week either exactly or roughly halfway through in or around our year 2025? I mean, is it merely a coincidence that this year would fall exactly halfway through the ninth week of Enoch? Or is it possible that this is all accurate and the year 2025 holds prophetic significance? To conclude the apocalypse of weeks, the Ethiopic version of Enoch states, And after this, in the tenth week, in the seventh part, there shall be the great eternal judgment, in which he will execute vengeance among the angels, and the first heaven shall depart and pass away, and a new heaven shall appear, and all the powers of the heavens shall give sevenfold light. Enoch 91, 15 through 16. The Dead Sea Scrolls version renders this passage as, And after that, the tenth week, in its seventh part, there will be eternal judgment and the moment of the great judgment, and he will carry out revenge in the midst of the holy ones. In it, the first heaven will pass away, and there will appear a new heaven, and all the forces of heaven will rise throughout all eternity, shining seven times more. 4Q Enoch 22b through 25a. This clearly refers to the end of the kingdom age, the great white throne judgment, and the creation of a new heavens and new earth. However, one small detail could be easy to overlook if we're not careful. Through the wording of the tenth week, we see an amazing detail about this entire prophecy. It's what's known as chiastically structured. A chiastic structure is a literary technique, meaning basically that the beginning and the ending match and are both reflected by the middle, like a palindrome which is a word or a sentence or paragraph that reads the same forward and backward, either by letter, such as the word kayak, or by word, such as the sentence, man is evil and evil is man. Our English word chiasmus comes from the Greek chiasmos, containing the letter ki or chi, which looks like our letter X. Basically, just like the top of the letter X mirrors the bottom with each part intersecting in the middle, a body of writing that's chiastically structured follows that same pattern. The bottom reflects the top. This method of writing is found all over Hebrew scripture. For example, Genesis 9-6 states, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. When reading it from a single line like that, it's kind of difficult to pick out the chiastic structure, but if we render it as follows and label each line, it can be a bit easier to see. Line A, whoever sheds, B, the blood, C, of man, C, by man, B, shall his blood, A, be shed. So as we can see, lines labeled A have the word shed, B have blood, and C have man. The entire prophecy of Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks is structured that same way. And I didn't notice this until I saw the familiar seventh part in week 10, remembering it from week one. This also explains and provides confirmation for the fact that week two and week nine have a similar structure as well. We can map out all the weeks by grouping them with their chiastic counterpart to see if there are any other commonalities. First, let's start with weeks one and weeks 10. Week 1, I was born the seventh in the first week, while judgment and righteousness still endured. Enoch 93, 3b. Week 10, and after this, in the tenth week, in the seventh part, there shall be the great eternal judgment, in which he will execute vengeance amongst the angels. And the first heaven shall depart and pass away, and a new heaven shall appear, and all the powers of the heavens shall give sevenfold light. Enoch 91, 15 through 16. Now here we plainly see the common phrasing of the seventh. Remember, too, the Dead Sea Scrolls say the seventh day for week one and seventh part for week ten. As we've seen, these are communicating the same thing, the final 100 years of that week. We also see a common theme of a time of judgment followed by righteousness. Now next, we can compare weeks two and nine. Week two, and after me there shall arise in the second week great wickedness, and deceit shall have sprung up, and in it there shall be the first end, and in it a man shall be saved, and after it is ended, unrighteousness shall grow up, and a law shall be made for the sinners. Enoch 93, 4. Week nine, and after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment shall be revealed to the whole world, and all the works of the godless shall vanish from all the earth, and the world shall be written down for destruction, and all mankind shall look to the path of uprightness. Enoch 91.14 Comparing these two, we begin to see why it sounds like the flood in week two. It's because the theme is the same as week nine. 
Now, whether it's talking about the flood after week two or the watchers and Nephilim within week two, that theme is still the same. No time frame is given and wickedness abounds, but something happens to stop evil. Next, weeks three and eight. Week three, and after that, in the third week, at its close, a man shall be elected as the plant of righteous judgment, and his posterity shall become the plant of righteousness forevermore. Enoch 93, 5. Week eight, and after that, there shall be another, the eighth week, that of righteousness, and a sword shall be given to it that a righteous judgment may be executed on the oppressors, and sinners shall be delivered into the hands of the righteous. And at its close, they shall acquire houses through their righteousness, and a house shall be built for the great king and glory forevermore. Enoch 91, 12 through 13. In weeks three and eight, we have the phrase at its close. The focus of week three is Israel. Specifically, it describes Abraham being called out from the pagans to start the nation of God's chosen people. In week eight, it's a similar idea, only with the church. There is a small group of people called out from the traditions of the day, Protestants coming out of Catholicism. Next, we can compare weeks four and seven. And after that, in the fourth week, at its close, visions of the holy and righteous shall be seen, and a law for all generations, and an enclosure shall be made for them. Enoch 93.6. Week 7. And after that, in the seventh week, shall an apostate generation arise, and many shall be its deeds, and all its deeds shall be apostate. And at its close shall be elected the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness, to receive sevenfold instruction concerning all his creation. Enoch 93, 9-10. Amazingly, these have to do with a small group of Jewish people coming out from a larger group of those rejecting the teachings of God. Week 4 is the exodus of the Jews from Egypt and the people of Pharaoh, who clearly rejected the teachings of God time and time again, resulting in the judgment of the plagues. Similarly, week 7 describes the Karahites coming out from Talmudic Judaism. We also have the phrase, at its close, in both weeks. Lastly, we can compare weeks 5 and 6. Week 5. And after that, in the fifth week, at its close, the house of glory and dominion shall be built forever. Enoch 93.7. Week 6. And after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded, and the hearts of all of them shall godlessly forsake wisdom. And in it a man shall ascend, and at its close the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. Enoch 93, 8. In this last set, at its close is repeated, but both weeks also center around some kind of temple or house. First, in week five, a house of glory and dominion is built forever, which, as stated earlier, might just refer to a certain dispensation of time. Then, in week six, the temple is being burned. What's in the middle of these two events? Who shows up? After a temple is built and before a temple is burned, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is the intersection point of this entire chiastic prophecy, and in my opinion, therein lies the whole point. After looking at this, I wondered if possibly the entire 7,000 years of human history would be laid out chiastically as well. If this is true, I've come to believe that it's in theme rather than exact time. So for example, we don't have Jesus showing up at exactly 3,500 AM, which would have been 425 BC, midway between the entire 7,000 years of human history. The only connection that I currently know of to the 425 BC is that year is the beginning of the 8th Una, which I write more about in my book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, and we can see described in a Dead Sea Scroll called 4Q Katina. But that's not surprising because if there are 14 Unas in total, which are 500 year periods, the end of the 7th and beginning of the 8th would be the halfway point. We could divide up the entire 7,000 years any way we want, and the midpoint will always be the same. I believe that is all that is being described between weeks 1 through 5 and 6 through 10 concerning specific years in the Book of Enoch. But setting time aside, when we think about the events that occur in weeks 1 through 5 and 6 through 10, as laid out in Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks, we can see how Jesus is in the middle of those events. I believe that's the point. It shows how human history is chiastically structured when looking at the events themselves 
rather than the exact time periods. Now, while it may not predict exact times, this prophecy can help explain the types of events that are coming in our future. If this prophecy could be used to predict exact times, we would be able to be a lot more precise in our forecasts. So for example, we know when the flood occurred, so we should be able to work backwards from the end of the 7,000 years to find something. The flood happened in 1656 AM. So if the years were as important as the events themselves, we should be able to subtract 1,656 years from the 7,000 years of totality to come up with 5,344 AM, which correlates to our year of 1419 AD. But we don't see anything worldwide or catastrophic that would compare to the flood happening in that year. However, if we take the themes of the 700 year periods themselves, we can see how they generally line up chiastically. It's possible that is what the author was trying to communicate and why the 7,000 years was split into 10 700 year periods rather than the typical four ages we already defined. Maybe this was only to show how the chiastic structure of all of human history points to Jesus in the middle and any other way of dividing the times would have destroyed that structure. Going back to the seventh part of week 10, the prophecy says the great judgment against the angels occurs in the seventh part, which would be sometime during the final 100 years of that 10th week. That means this period would begin in AD 2975. Sometime after that, we don't know exactly when since it just says in its seventh part, possibly during the last jubilee of the kingdom age, the final judgment will occur. Next, the new creation begins. If there's a correlation point between the times and events of ages, 1,000 years before this judgment is set to start would have been the year AD 1975. So this means in our age, we've finished almost half of our final 100 years and are heading towards our final jubilee, pointing again to the year AD 2025. Now, if this prophecy is accurate, our time within the current order of things is truly short. Jesus is set to return sometime in the ninth week to set up his kingdom. Then, near the end of the tenth week, will be the final judgment explained in Revelation. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire revelation 27 through 15 kjv while this is a horrific reality the wonderful news is that none of us needs to go through this terrible judgment we can put our trust in christ today escape eternal torment, and live within an eternal bliss. Finally, to explain what comes after the 10 weeks, the Dead Sea Scrolls version of Enoch states, After that, there will be many weeks, the number of which will not have an end, ever, in which goodness and justice will be achieved. 4Q Enoch 425 b through 26 the Ethiopic version says something similar, but we're offered a couple more verses that are definitely worth reading. And after that, there will be many weeks without number forever, and all shall be in goodness and righteousness, and sin shall no more be mentioned forever. And now I tell you, my sons, and show you the paths of righteousness 
and the paths of violence. Yea, I will show them to you again, that ye may know what will come to pass. And now hearken unto me, my sons, and walk in the paths of righteousness, and walk not in the paths of violence. For all who walk in the paths of unrighteousness shall perish forever. Enoch 91, 17 through 19. It is a tragic truth that there are many who will not heed those words, who will choose the paths of unrighteousness by denying Christ, and who will unfortunately perish forever without hope. For anyone watching this, this does not have to be your fate. As long as there is breath in your lungs, there is still time to ensure your eternal security by putting your trust in Jesus Christ. Now this is not achieved by works or by proving your own righteousness. Scripture tells us that God sees our righteousness as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. Instead of trying to earn it through good works or deeds and never really knowing if you've done enough, true eternal life is obtained and accomplished by accepting the gift of salvation in Jesus through faith and allowing his righteousness to be credited to you. In making that decision, you can be assured that you will get to enjoy all the eternal gifts described in the final chapter of the book of Revelation and elsewhere throughout the Bible and even the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you haven't already, I would highly encourage you to consider taking this chance today, right now, to accept God's gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ.